I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Hilliard Macbeth, author of the book, When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. He's also a portfolio manager and financial advisor in Edmonton. Welcome back to the show, Hilliard. Nice to be back. Hilliard, you said you were just talking to some clients and came up with a surprising fact that perhaps a lot of us don't know. What is that surprising fact? Well, one of the things that uh, we were talking about was the uh, cost of shale oil in uh, in Texas going down below $35 a barrel. And uh, I was pointing out to them that the cost of heavy oil in northern Alberta and Fort McMurray and around that area is up and around $80 a barrel. So it's a very, very dangerous situation for Alberta in terms of the viability of the oil sands. And then today, there was a shock announcement that came out that indicated that um, the uh, ExxonMobil, the owner of a huge amount of the oil and gas reserves in near Fort McMurray and the oil sands, have written off the full value of the reserves at their latest project, which is called Curl, uh, starting K, like Pearl, but with a K, uh, which was just recently built. It's only been uh, open for a very short period of time. And it doesn't mean, apparently, that they are going to stop production there, but they're just saying that the value of the reserves is basically, at the current prices, is um, is no longer there. And uh, so it's a, it's a, there's a lot of moving parts to this thing, and things are moving very quickly, but the, the the bigger shock to me, and um, I think it's a surprise to most people when they find out, is how much cheaper the shale oil in Texas, especially in Texas at the, what's called the Permian Basin. And uh, I was just checking uh, on ExxonMobil uh, after this announcement came out and discovered that their biggest new investments have been in the Permian Basin in Texas. So, uh, you know, it's pretty clear that they've uh, made their choice to move from um, heavy oil in Alberta with their latest investments to... Uh, to buy into the the shale oil in uh, in uh, Texas and other places probably too. I mean they're, they're all over the world, obviously, but but Texas and and you know it was at um, at great expense because they were not early adopters of this. Uh, there's been people in the Permian Basin for quite a long time now, and uh, so for Exxon to move in there now, they had to pay top dollar to uh, to get in. In fact, the the amount of money that's being invested in Texas and the, the western part of Texas is enormous right now, people chasing that Permian Basin. But what they've discovered is they can go into the shale oil, they can frack it, they can, uh, with new technology, they can, they can, um, they can produce it at under $40 a barrel compared to the all-in costs in um, Alberta of more like 60 to $80 a barrel. What kind of a, a shockwave has that done for the whole industry in Alberta? Well, I think they, uh, there's still a lot of optimism in Alberta, and, and people are, are not really uh, sure what's happening, but they, they like, you know, generally Albertans have to be optimistic because it is a boom-bust uh, economy, and, uh, and we've had a boom for quite a long time now, and now we're going through a recession, but they, um, they know that um, the oil sands will not be shut down, even though... Um, Exxon's done this shock announcement uh, about the remaining reserves. They're still going to keep producing the oil. Um, they just can't count in their reserves uh, a value for the remainder of that 3.5 billion barrels of oil. And um, so it doesn't mean the production won't continue. In fact, uh, Alberta's the, the biggest exporter of oil to the U.S. of any, all the countries, uh, bigger than OPEC, bigger than Mexico, bigger than any of the countries, and a lot of it comes from Alberta. Most of it comes from Alberta. So, uh, so it's a, uh, and of course now the former head of Exxon is uh, Rex Tillerson is now the in the in the White House with uh, Donald Trump. So he's one of the top officials there now. Um, just just 
left Exxon and moved there. So it, it's it, things are moving very rapidly, but the reality is the cost of producing oil as a result of the shale revolution is coming down, and uh, Canadians need to get our costs down so that they can be economic. And this this adjustment to the reserves, the three and a half billion barrels of um, of uh, reduction in reserves, is entirely based on the quality of the reserves against the cost of producing them, and they've decided it's no longer economic. So the the uh, new calculation for Exxon at Curl is uh, 13 years of, of um, reserve life as opposed to uh, much longer before. Um, now, whether that means they leave all those 3.3 billion barrels in the ground, it remains to be seen because the price of oil could rebound later on and Albertans' optimism could be justified. But if the oil price doesn't rebound, then uh, there will be some major changes coming. And uh, it's time for uh, Alberta to diversify into other areas, perhaps. Well, I know people keep saying electric cars someday are going to surpass the sales of regular cars. China last year sold 400,000 electric cars. That sounds like a lot, but I do know, at least during peak sales, they were selling 50,000 regular cars a day. So that was that would just be eight days worth of regular car sales over a whole year. So electrics still aren't a big factor. No, uh, the total um, a total uh, oil consumption in the U.S. is 18 million barrels a day, and nine million barrels a day of of, of it, half of it is going to uh, passenger and light trucks, which is basically passenger as well, probably. So um, you know, even even one or two million barrels of reduction. Um, because of electric cars, it would require a huge increase in the number of electric cars on the highway and, I, and on, the, on the roads, and I, I, I don't see that happening any anytime soon. But I do expect that electric cars will will gain in their uh, importance faster than people realize. Um, not not just because of the oil. In fact, the oil might be the the smallest part of it, but uh, mostly because they're so much more fun to drive. <laughs> so if they can get the cost down, now Tesla. The other announcement came out today was Tesla is on track to produce their Model 3, which is their, the current models are un, basically unaffordable. They started at $100,000 and go up from there. Uh, but the um, the new model, the Model 3 that's coming out, um, is expected, the first models are going to be out um, the middle of, according to Tesla, they're going to be out the middle of uh, this summer, so in a, three months from now, roughly, and, uh, and then uh, full production will be hit about a year later which is expected to be a huge number, like um, 500,000 cars a year. They're producing right now about 100,000 cars a year, a little bit less, and um, they're expecting to ramp up to 500,000 cars a year, which is still a, a small percentage. What's that, 3% of the 16 million cars a year that are built in the U.S.? But it will have an impact, I suspect. There's all, there's other, there's other uh, competitors like... Um, the Chevy Bolt and the Volt and all that, which are expected to ramp up fairly quickly now as well. So, um, and BC does have a program where I think they give you thirty five hundred dollars, five thousand bucks if you buy an electronic car, if it's under a certain amount of money. Yeah, I think that that is that is, that incentive exists in the U.S. as well, in California at least, anyway. Uh, but I think it runs out after a certain number of cars are sold, as I recall. So. Uh, Norway is the world leader in that. Norway um, has got a huge incentive for people to have electric cars there. And in fact, Norway has uh, announced that um, I think in 2025 or something there will be no gasoline or diesel cars sold. It will have to be all electric. So, Well, uh, London is a place that definitely needs them as the city literally is choking on diesel. Uh, in fact, the last time I went to London, I mean, the, the city stenched of diesel. And uh, I was coughing up black chunks for two weeks after I came home. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because I was in Glasgow uh, a year and a half ago, and uh, because of it being in the European Union, they out they have to have diesel. I think that's the only way they could meet the standards. And this was before the the Volkswagen scandal came out, and um, I I really noticed the air was uh, was murky with with particles or whatever. I didn't know I didn't really know what it was at the time. I only put two and two together afterwards when that announcement by Volkswagen came out that uh, the emissions were much higher than what they thought. So 
I think the the combination of the scandal at Volkswagen off over these uh, diesel engines and the um, the um, the attractiveness of electric is it's going to be it, it's 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 going to gain momentum and it's going to be unstoppable basically. Now there is a criticism um, that uh, right now the electricity a lot of it's produced by coal. And so you're not really getting any further ahead in terms of saving the planet just by switching all the cars to electric. And that's true. So, uh, it, you know, they, in order to save the planet, if people are worried about global warming, then they have to not only switch to electric cars, but they also have to switch the fuel source away from coal uh, to produce the electricity. Although uh, new coal plants are high tech and pollute a whole lot less than they used to. Yeah, I. Yeah. But we do have natural gas to replace the coal, right? Natural gas is relatively cheap. Natural gas has become so cheap now, and again, the, we talked about shale oil a minute ago, but shale gas, is there's so much shale gas, it's it's incredible, and uh, not really uh, even understood fully, I don't think, that the amount of shale uh, gas that they've discovered, and, that, and that's in a different part of the United States, a lot of it's in Pennsylvania and New York, and they haven't even drilled, uh, they only drilled a tiny fraction of it. It actually goes up into Canada and Quebec, and they haven't allowed, both New York and Quebec haven't allowed any drilling for shale gas, but um, gas would fill the bill uh, without any problem. And the gas plants that produce electricity are much easier to build. And they're also, um, as one of the things with um, with solar and wind is uh, the, the reliability. Uh, the, there isn't always, you can't always be sure that the electricity is available with solar and wind, depending on whether it's nighttime or the wind isn't blowing or something. So gas is perfect to fill in the gaps because it can be, unlike a coal plant, it can be started up and shut down very easily. The, all of the natural gas plants that are in existence now pretty much are there because of um, of the balancing demand. They're basically on standby, if you like. Uh, but they could actually perform perform a base uh, a base function if it was in combination with these other things. So it's you know it's hard to say for sure what's going to happen, but um, uh, it looks like they could really improve the uh, the environment by switching to those things. But on the other hand. Um, it's hard not to have these discussions that talk, oh, talking about the new uh, Trump administration in the United States, but they have gone completely the other, the other direction by by appointing a, a very anti-environmental type person as the head of the EPA, and so we don't know what's going to happen as a result of that. Um, then well, you, yeah, part of their pro-coal thing was it's now legal again to dump coal waste into rivers. Yeah, they've, they've done a lot of stuff, and... Uh, they're doing a lot of stuff, and now most of that's just on executive order so far, so it doesn't actually it hasn't actually gotten through the Congress yet. But but uh, and some of it probably won't get through the Congress, but um, because there's a limit to what the president can do on executive orders. But the the direction, the intention is certainly clear. Uh, they want to they want to uh, change the direction of the way things were going under Obama. Some people would agree with that. Some people would disagree with it. But uh, it's um, uh, it, the, the world is changing very quickly, and uh, you know this. This the, the in Alberta. Getting back to your question about Alberta, we for many many years, probably a couple of decades, uh, Canadians and Albertans were were able to just kind of not weren't forced. We're able to just sort of ignore all the world developments and just just believe that if we built more uh, oil sands plants and increased our oil production, our exports would be there, our pipelines would be there, and we. We'd be able to profit and enjoy enjoy all that growth, but now everything everything's up in the air now. Everything has to be questioned now, which is a, a very difficult change for people to make. I think a lot of people are are still kind of on the side of just uh, it's just um, you know just ignore the changes and uh, things will get will be back to where we were in a, in a year or two. But um, that's probably not what's going to happen. I mean, you never know for sure, but uh, more likely what will happen is uh, these changes, some of them will be permanent, and we'll have to learn how to adjust. We'll have more with Hillard Macbeth right after the break. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. 
Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa, located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Hilliard Macbeth. Hilliard, you had an interesting statistic about the Toronto Stock Exchange. Yeah, so one of the things that's happened as a result of this incredible housing boom that we've had for the last 15, 20 years is that the people that lend the money have been making bigger and bigger profits pretty well every year in the Canadian bank sector. And, you know, it's the whole lending sector, which includes other companies besides the banks. But if you just focus on the banks, uh, it's happened um, three times in the last 35 years that I'm aware of. Uh, the profits of the banks make up more than 50% of the profits of all of the companies listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So uh, it's hard to imagine because really it's just six companies. And actually, in reality, it's actually the big three. The big three are Royal being the biggest, TD is the second biggest, and Scotia. And then their three others are quite a bit smaller. So... The percentage of profits hit a peak of 59% sometime last year, and there's now around 55%. And this has only been reached a couple of times before, once in the uh, late 70s, once in the late 80s, and and just recently again. And the interesting thing about those three periods was there was a major housing crash after all three of those uh, events. So um, one of the things that the Canadian lenders do not like to emphasize, and they generally don't talk about it, uh, very much. They like to talk about other things like capital markets and expanding into the U.S. and all that. But the reality is uh, most of their profits are earned by lending to the household sector. And we've seen in the last 17 years, we've seen the household debt um, sector in uh, Canada triple, more than triple, uh, one of the biggest increases in the whole world. The only country that has a bigger increase in household debt um, is actually two of them. Uh, Switzerland and China are the only two, and they they were, they were only slightly bigger than that. And Australia is a close fourth. So those countries have had. Uh, I'm not sure about Switzerland. Switzerland might be a special case because uh, of uh, its status as a safe haven place to park your money. But certainly Australia, Canada, and China, the common denominator there is um, housing, a real boom in housing, and. I think Canada is unique in having uh, more than 50% of all the profits of the Toronto Stock Exchange. There's about 220 companies listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and uh, so for uh, for more than 50% of the profits to accrue to just six companies is is, is amazing. And I, I don't think people realize that. I suspect that um, it'd be a shock to most people in Canada that uh, the banks are making so much profit off of people's. Uh, it's not just housing too, but I guess it's auto auto loans, um, uh, credit cards. Home equity line of credit is very popular. All of the all of the things that uh, people do to borrow money, and a lot of it is just basically, um, I want it now. I don't want to wait for it. I want it now. So, and I, if the bank will approve the loan, then why wouldn't I go and borrow the money? Right? It's, uh, the interest rates are very low. Um, the monthly payments are affordable. So, let's do it. In Vancouver, we've seen big house that single dwelling homes. Prices uh, come down quite significantly in the past year. What's happening with the Alberta market? So the stats in Alberta are a little bit different. The the the, the Edmonton and Calgary markets are basically roughly flat over the last twelve months. They had dropped between five and ten percent uh, when the oil price came down in two thousand and fourteen, two thousand and fifteen, and they haven't recovered, but they haven't they haven't gone down much more either. And one of the reasons for that is that. Um, the, um, the number of sales has been quite modest at the high end. So one of the ways that the average price comes down is that the um, the very expensive homes, like the two, three, four million dollar homes, uh, they often drop by the most. So the uh, four million home, home, a guy's desperate, maybe he gets into trouble, maybe he goes bankrupt or whatever, for foreclosure, and it ends up selling at 2.5 million. Well, that's a, what is that, a 40% drop roughly. So that would skew the index quite dramatically. Um, but there haven't been very many sales like that, and, and if they are, and, and the, the way the um, 
the index works is if they are done through foreclosure at a at a, a judicial sale with the court involved, they don't get included in the average anyway. Uh, but what has been pretty active in in um, Edmonton and Calgary, and I think maybe in Vancouver too, is the average priced home in Edmonton and Calgary. It's roughly around four hundred to four fifty in that range. There's actually been a very steady uh, bid for those homes, and the prices have not dropped much at all there. So, the, in fact, if anything, so in some cases, the prices might have, might have gone up a little bit. So, so the the, the expensive home market is 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 um, very weak. But if there's no sale, if or if it goes in the in a in a judicial sale, it doesn't get included in the index. But the average home is uh, is holding its own so far. But I don't expect that to continue. And one of the reasons why that won't continue is that rents are dropping very rapidly. So the, the drop in the what you can rent an um, apartment for, and there's a huge new supply of, of uh, rental product coming on the market in Edmonton and Calgary, um, has come down quite dramatically because of this uh, excess supply. So, uh, you know, people are looking at it and saying, well, if I can rent a half-decent place for 1400 a month, then maybe it's easier than uh, than buying a place. I, I've, I hear from people every, almost every day now that, they're opting to rent rather than buy, and, and partly because they're afraid that the market might drop further, and partly because they recognize that uh, renting is a lot less uh, stress. It's, other than if you get evicted, <laughs> renting is is, got, is a much lower stress uh, status that you don't have to worry about if the if the plumbing breaks and there's a flood in the basement or something. That's the landlord's problem. It's not your problem. So. Uh, but I, I fully expect to see further drops. One interesting thing that uh, people may not be aware of is the. Now, this isn't true in Calgary. It's just true in Edmonton. In Edmonton, the peak price was actually reached in 2007, and the price today is actually a little bit lower than it was in 2007, as measured by the Terranet National Bank Index. So, we actually now are into our tenth year of lower prices in Edmonton. And I, you know, I don't. I don't think. Uh, I don't. I don't even know if your listeners are going to believe me when I say that, but I've got the I've got the data to back it up, and it comes from a re- reputable source, Terranet National Bank. So. Also, the Bank of Montreal admitting that Toronto now has a real estate bubble. Really it's amazing. They, they just so, caught caught on to that. The chief economist of the uh, of the Bank of Montreal, um, one of the big six banks, uh, came out a few days ago, earlier this week, and said that uh, Toronto. Is in a bubble. I think he said, "Let's let's drop the pretense." So, in other words, up until now, they've been saying it isn't in a bubble, but it was a pretense. <laughs> it actually was in a bubble, but now they have to basically admit that it's, it is a bubble. And I think that's because of the twenty percent year-over-year gain in in the single-family home in uh, Toronto. I had a I had a call or an email, I should say, from uh, from uh, uh, somebody saying that they were desperately trying not to buy into the Toronto housing market. They live on the outskirts of Toronto. And there's a lot of pressure on them from their uh, from their family and their his, in this case his wife's parents who are offering a down payment and I was encouraging him not to uh, not to succumb to the pressure. Uh, but the problem is a year ago they offered to give him a down payment to buy a house and and now a year later he could have bought 20 percent cheaper if he'd listened to them a year ago. <laughs> it gets it gets harder and harder to say no, and uh, that's the problem with these bubbles. I mean, eventually uh, they all burst. But before they burst, what happens is they they basically force almost everybody to um, to uh, have to buy, and uh, it, you know you saw it in um, in Vancouver, and now obviously something's changed there. Uh, so basically, Toronto is the last place left standing. One of the things that happened, and I think it happened in Vancouver too, is the 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 city of Toronto, which is actually a small portion of the Greater Toronto area has gone up really fast. So now we're starting to get the um, the places in Burlington and Hamilton and um, Aurelia and Barrie and all these places are, are going up even faster as people start looking around. But I'm, I'm pretty sure it's speculators. I don't think it's um, it's real uh, people that are actually choosing to live there. And what it's called is fear of missing out. You know, people say, if I don't buy now, I'll never be able to buy. This is exactly what this email said from this one fellow. said, his, uh, his in-laws are saying to him, if you don't get in now, you'll never be get, never be able to get in. And that's because people are saying that it's going to go up forever, which of course is, is wrong and it's false and it is, is, I mean, it could happen, but it's never happened before. These things always reverse direction as people are seeing in Vancouver. But when you're in the middle of them, it feels like it's going to keep going forever. 
Hilliard, what's your opinion of BC's $37,500 first-time home buyer mortgage helper plan? It's not. It's not really helping the first-time buyer. Um, uh, it's it's actually helping the people that are trying to sell their houses after owning them for many years who have a huge gain on their houses because their problem is there's fewer and fewer people that can afford to buy them. Right? Now, do the does this government loan at thirty seven and a half thousand dollars is it guaranteed by CMHC or is this kind of a muddy area? Well, then you know CMHC only guarantees it to the lender, right? It doesn't guarantee it to the home buyer. So it's it's, it's the government would be on the hook for if people default on those loans, I'm, I'm, or should say when they default on those loans. Some of them will default on those loans, and the the BC government will just have to, the taxpayer will have to eat it, just like the taxpayer has to eat the CMHC losses when they come as well. So so it's uh, it's a, it's it was a it was, I guess, like a lot of these things, it, it was started on good intentions to help people get into the housing market when they were short of money. But it's taken on a, a different twist now where it's actually really just helping the people that are trying to sell houses because it's getting harder and harder to sell houses, except in Toronto, as we discussed. But in Vancouver and these other places, it's it's uh, the problem is these people that have these huge gains in the housing market because they bought in 10 years ago uh, are finding it harder and harder to, to to sell because there's fewer and fewer people that can afford to buy at these prices. So that's what that policy did. The, the extra 37.5 just allows uh, people who probably can't afford it to get into the market um, at ridiculously high prices. And the head of CMHC is, is basically saying that. It was actually, in a, it's interesting, he made this comment in a speech to the to the Bank of England in, in London, England. He didn't say it in Canada, but of course it was reported here. And um, it makes perfect sense to me. What was it exactly he said? He said, in fact, it may be a fool's bargain with the extra demand simply feeding higher house prices. The benefits of the policy accruing to wealthier home sellers rather than to the young first-time home buyers it purports to help. Hilliard, thank you so much for chatting with us. Nice to be on your show again. My guest has been Hilliard Macbeth, author of the book When the Bubble Bursts, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show can be emailed to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.